All right, ladies and gentlemen, so in this uh, tutorial video, I'm going to take you through uh, a number of uh, different problems involving economic analysis and financial analysis, all relating to the real world example of Whataburger's honey butter chicken, uh, chicken biscuits. Honey butter chicken biscuits. So the scenario that we're given is that one of Whataburger's most popular menu items is the honey butter chicken biscuit. Here are the supply and demand schedules for this hearty breakfast snack. Note, P is the menu price in U.S. dollars and Q is the quantity in millions of honey butter chicken biscuits. We're given information for a line that we'll call supply and a line that we'll call demand. And it's not stated in this problem and we'll be able to determine this fact through analysis, but these are going to be linear curves. So uh, remember, linear, linear, these are going to be straight lines. There's going to be a line generated from this data that we're going to call supply and a line generated from this demand data, uh, this data here that we're going to call demand. <clears throat> okay, so the first part of this is no different than the analysis that you did in Algebra 1 where you solved, you wrote systems of equations by first taking table data and turning it into an equation and then um, using those equations in either an elimination or a substitution uh, exercise to solve for the variables where those two lines intersect. So basically we're going to write two linear equations, one for supply and one for demand, and then we're going to solve that system of linear equations to find out where those two curves cross. All right. So first we have to figure out what is our dependent variable, what's our independent variable. Well in economics, price, P, is the dependent variable. And so in our previous learning, we would have called that Y. And Q is the independent variable. And in our previous learning, we would have called that X. So just for now, and we'll, we'll substitute those P's and Q's later, but let's label these uh, Y and X. And you see what I did there? I labeled it backwards. You gotta make sure you label the P as Y and the Q as X. You get confused. It's very easy to get confused. So now we just start going through our process of writing a linear equation given table data. Well, let's first figure out if this is a linear equation by computing the rate of change. What we're hoping is that we find a constant rate of change. So first we'll compute the change in Y and then we'll compute the change in X. All right, this would be the change in P or the change in Q. All right, so from two to four, that's plus two. And from four to five, that's plus one. From two to six, that's plus four. And from six to eight, that's plus two. All right, well, we're ready to rock and roll. Uh, because all we have to do is compute the change in y over the change in x in order to get the slope or the rate of change. So 2 over 4 is 1 over 2, so that's 1 over 2. Then we have 1 over 2. 1 over 2. So I'm getting the 2 from here and the 4 from here. Change in y over change in x and then 1 which is a change in y over the change in x, which is two, and I get one half for both examples. Two over four reduces to one over two. These are the same, so we have a constant rate of change, which means we have a linear equation that we're gonna be able to write. So, first things first, we have to use the point slope formula. Now our slope in this example, uh, and here we're first gonna compute our supply equation Okay, so the left side of this will be for supply, where M is one half. Okay, and then we have a point, because to use the point slope formula, you need a point and a slope. We'll use this, two comma two. All right here, I'm taking X as two, and then Y as two. My point slope formula is y minus y1 equals m, open parentheses, x minus x1, close parentheses. Substituting in the values, I have y minus 2 
equals one half open parentheses x minus two close parentheses rewrite the left side y minus two equals distribute one half through the parenthetical expression that's one half x and then one half times negative two is negative two over two because negative two times one is negative two over two reduces to negative one so we have y minus two equals one half x minus one let's finish by adding two to both sides and we have y equals one half x plus one because negative one plus two is positive one okay and now we need to substitute in p for y and q for x so this is going to be price supply equals one half q supply and i'm indicating that with these little subscripts s plus one this is actually called the inverse supply function that's what we just found here okay inverse supply function so we'll label that inverse supply function we'll need that here in a second now in order to get this in the proper form we need to get q by itself on the left and everything else on the right in the standard economic form where the variable on the left is q, uh, which would be the x variable. So you're basically solving for x, which we're substituting for q. So all I'm asking you to do is solve for q. Well, the first step in doing that would be to subtract 1 from both sides. And now I have p sub s minus 1 equals 1 half q sub s. To get q by itself, I just multiply everything by the reciprocal of 1 half, which is just 2. Well, 2 over 1. So I multiply both sides of this equation by 2 over 1. Okay? So on the right side, the 1s and 2s cancel out, leaving q sub s by itself. And then on the left side, I distribute, multiply the 2 over 1 to each term in the parentheses. So that would be 2p sub s minus 2. Well, according to this equation up here, I need to put this negative 2 over here. So I'll have to move it by adding 2 to both sides. And then I'll have to subtract 2p sub s from both sides. And then I'll have to move this q sub s over here. Okay, so let me show you what that looks like. I have to subtract q sub s from both sides, and I have to subtract 2p sub s and add 2 to both sides. So I'm going to do all these operations all at once just so you can see what ends up happening. Okay, so now I have negative q sub s equals negative 2p sub s plus 2. And if I change all the signs to get rid of this negative sign and reorient these to make it look like this, I get q sub s equals negative 2 plus 2 p sub s. And that's my equation of supply right down there. Almost ran out of room there. Okay, and now for demand. So that was supply. We'll do demand over here. So this will be demand. All right, well, first we have to figure out the rate of change, and let's hope it's constant. That would indicate linear. So I'll compute change in Y and then change in X. Well, from 3.5 to 3.25, that's minus 0.25. And from 3.25 to 2, well, that's minus 1.25. Over here, from 2 to 3, that's plus 1. And from 3 to 8, that's plus 5. Okay, so my change in Y over my change in X 
would be negative 0.25 over 1, which is just negative 0.25. And now I have to do negative 1.25 over 5. Well, negative 1.25 divided by 5 is also negative 0.25. So these are the same. <clears throat> we have a constant rate of change. So we have demand here, our slope m is equal to negative 0.25, okay, which is also negative 1 fourth, okay, which you could just get by hitting math, enter, enter, negative 1 fourth. And the point that we'll use is 8 comma 2, 8 comma 2. It's very important you write them this way. Remember, your x comes first, but these are written backwards. So this is x1, and this is y1. Remember, our point-slope formula is y minus y1 equals m, open parentheses, x minus x1, close parentheses. Substituting in my values, I have y minus 2 equals negative 1 fourth, open parentheses, x minus 8, close parentheses. So now I rewrite y minus 2, set that equal to the distributed product here, negative 1 fourth x, and now negative 1 times negative 8 is positive 8 divided by 4 is positive 2, plus 2. Okay, well, I'll just add 2 to both sides. And now I have y equals negative 1 fourth x plus 4. Right, let's substitute in our letters. P, this time sub D, is equal to negative 1 fourth Q sub D plus 4. And remember, we call this the inverse demand function. Okay, this is the inverse demand function. Inverse demand. We'll need this in a second when we graph the lines. Well, now I want to solve, to make it look like this, I want to solve for Q. <clears throat> so first thing I'll do here is I'll add 1 4th Q to both sides, 1 4th Q sub D to both sides. And now I have 1 4th Q sub D plus P sub D equals... 4. Okay, well now I just have to subtract P sub D from both sides. And I'll go new line up here. I now have over here 1 fourth Q sub D equals 4 minus P sub D. So I just have to multiply both sides by the reciprocal of the Q sub D coefficient, which is 4 over 1. 4 over 1. So on the left, these all cancel out. And I have Q sub D equals, distribute, 4 times 4 is 16, minus 4 P sub D. Okay, so this is the demand equation, right? So this over here, this is the supply equation, and this is the demand equation. Now let me write those again so we've got them all together. Quantity supply is equal to negative 2 plus 2 times P. And quantity demanded is equal to 16 minus 4 P sub D. All right, well, we have two simultaneous linear equations, and we're going to be able to solve those equations to find out where they intersect. Number two. Use substitution or elimination to find the market equilibrium price, P sub E, 
and the market e equilibrium quantity Q sub E, then graph both curves on a coordinate plane provided here. The first thing we have to do is use substitution and elimination. Let's write down our equations. We have Q sub S equals negative 2 plus 2 P sub S and Q sub D equals 16 minus 4 P sub D. All right now we're going to solve this using elimination by subtraction and we're going to ignore these subscripts for a second. Okay so Q minus Q is 0. We've eliminated Q. This is 0 equals negative 2 minus 16. That's negative 18. And then 2 minus negative 4 is 2 plus 4 plus 4 uh, plus 6 rather P. So let's add 18 to both sides. And now we have 18 equals 6p. Well, divide both sides by 6. 18 divided by 6 is 3 equals p. And this is p sub e. This is the price equilibrium. Okay. Well, now we know the price equilibrium. To find the quantity equilibrium, we just have to plug in 3 into one of our equations. So here we have uh, q sub s equals negative 2 plus 2 open parentheses 3 okay well now we call this q sub e because this is the quantity equilibrium equal to negative 2 plus 6 2 times 3 is 6 so the quantity equilibrium is equal to negative uh, negative 2 plus 6 is positive 4 what does all this mean this means that when the price of the honey butter chicken biscuit is three dollars, the quantity is four million units. Okay, four million honey butter chicken biscuits. If we plot that on this coordinate plane, we first have to determine what our, our dependent axis should be labeled and our independent axis. Well, our dependent axis is price. And this is for units of honey butter chicken biscuits. And our independent axis is quantity. Okay, price and quantity. Let's see if I can make this a little bit darker so you can see it. Okay, so let's graph, let's, let's remember that the intersection uh, on a coordinate plane is the solution to the system of linear equations. So the solution to this system of linear equations, which we normally say is x comma y, here we're going to say is q comma p, q sub e comma p sub e. Well, q sub e is 4. We know it means 4 million. And p sub e is 3, and we know that means $3. Right? And I'll explain what's, what this means here in a second. So, let's go graph this point, 4, 3, right here. This is called the market equilibrium. This is where the two lines, supply and demand, cross. And it, it's where both the consumers and the producers are happy. So, now we have to graph our lines. And to do that, we're going to need our inverse equations. So, first we'll graph our supply line. P sub S equals 1 half Q sub S plus 1. Well, all that means is we have a y-intercept of 1 down here. Okay, let's put a dot there. And we have a slope of 1 half, so we go up 1 over 1 over 2. Don't get confused about this 1.5. That's an intermediate value. You're going up 1 full unit and then over 1 over 2. See, what it means is, for every dollar increase in price, Whataburger will supply 2 million more units of honey butter chicken biscuits. And then we go up 1 over 1, 2. Up 1 over 1, 2. 
and we can carefully graph in our line with a straight edge. Now, when you graph in lines on economics, you don't go past the price axis. So you start on the edge of that axis and go up like this, and this is your supply curve. Well, now let's graph the demand line. So we have, we'll use the uh, inverse demand line. So price, demand price is equal to negative one fourth demand quantity plus four. Well, what this means is we start at four right here and we have a, a negative slope. So we go down one over one, two, three, four. Down one over one, two, three, four. Okay, what this means is whenever price falls by one dollar, the quantity demanded increases by four million units. Okay, so now we connect those dots. This is our quantity demanded uh, line, our quantity line, our demand line rather, and we label that D. Now this is where those equations come in. We'll label our supply curve Q sub S equals negative 2 plus 2 P sub S. And we'll label our demand curve Q sub D equals 16 minus 4 P sub D. And this is our quantity equilibrium. And this is our price equilibrium. And this right here, this is called our equilibrium of our market, our market equilibrium. Okay. I guess I should label that M sub E. Okay, market equilibrium. Now, uh, we've done number two, and we've graphed our supply curve and our demand curve. Notice that the supply curve goes up and the demand curve goes down. So demand is always a negatively sloped line or a curve, and the supply curve is always a positively sloped line, uh, ex except in special, special cases where demand could be totally vertical or totally horizontal. Same thing for supply, but they're really weird. Focusing just on this kind of normal market behavior, we see that as price goes down, quantity demanded goes up. That means there's an inverse relationship between price and quantity demanded. When price falls, quantity demanded goes up. When price rises, quantity demanded goes down. In a very dissimilar way, or in exactly the opposite way, when price goes up, quantity supplied goes up. When price goes down, quantity supplied goes down. So those are directly proportional between price and quantity supplied, and they are inversely proportional between price and quantity demanded. That's why those curves look like that. Number three, calculating profit and margin. All right, some new, some new stuff here. Determine Whataburger's gross profit at the market equilibrium, E sub M. Assume the honey butter chicken biscuit unit cost of $1. And then B, calculate net profit and net profit margin, assuming a 35% corporate income tax. Okay. First, we have to understand these terms. What is gross profit? Right? Gross profit. This is an accounting term. That's equal to sales. minus the cost, okay? And we call those costs, cost of goods sold, C-O-G-S, COGS, cost of goods sold. Sales could also be called revenue. Okay, so revenue, sales, cost, cost of goods sold. So gross profit is just equal to sales or revenue minus cost or cost of goods sold. So we have to figure out what the sales are. Well, let's go back to our graph. We can figure that out. At $3 a unit, the quantity sold is 4 
million units. So we could say sales equals three dollars, okay, three dollars times four million units. That's four million honey butter chicken biscuit sandwiches. And what is that equal to? I'll put it out here. Well, three times four is 12, so three times four million is 12 million. Okay, so this is $12 million. Well, what's the cost of sales? Well, the cost of each one is $1. So the cost, or COGS, cost of goods sold, is equal to $1 times 4 million units, the number of units sold, in other words. So that's equal to $4 million. Okay? So gross profit is just this minus this. Twelve million minus four million is eight million. So this is eight million dollars. And this is their gross profit, okay? So that's something we wanted. We wanted the gross profit. Now they ask us to compute the gross profit margin. Okay, what is this thing called margin? Margin is a percent. So the way that you compute it for gross profit, this is gross profit margin. Is that you take the gross profit which remember the gross profit was revenue minus cost and you divide it by sales or total revenue. Okay, then you multiply that by 100 to turn it into a percent. So let's plug in what we have here. Our gross profit was 8 million. Okay, and we divide that by our total revenue or our total sales which was 12 million. Right? And then we multiply that by 100. Let's see what that's equal to. We can just drop all the zeros and do 8 divided by 12 times 100 equals 66.6666666. 6, repeating is 66 uh, and 2 thirds percent. Okay, that's gross profit margin, which we can call GPM. All right, so now we computed the gross profit margin. What that means is, on every dollar of sales, the company gets to keep 66 and two-thirds cents. That's before taxes, okay? Now, okay, so this is all part A. and part B, they said calculate the net profit assuming a 35% corporate income tax rate. Well... What you do is, in order to find out what your taxable income, what your this is your taxable income right here is eight million. You multiply gross profit we're assuming there's no other expenses times tax rate. right? Well, that's equal to eight million. Time, we'll just write 8. We know it's 8 million. 8 million times 35% as a decimal is 8 times 0.35. Well, that's equal to 8 times 0.35 is $2.8 million. So the tax, this is the tax you have to pay, is $2,800,000. That's a lot of money. So net profit after tax, or again, we're assuming there's no other expenses in the business, 
net profit is just going to be equal to our gross profit. minus tax because that's the only other expense we have so net profit is equal to eight million okay of course it's eight million dollars minus two million eight hundred thousand dollars right and we should put dollar signs well let's see what that is eight minus two point eight is 5.2 million so this is five million two hundred thousand dollars well the net profit margin net profit margin is just equal to the net profit it's very similar to the gross profit margin net profit divided by sales or total revenue we'll write revenue this time times 100 to make it into a percent so what is that equal to well net profit is five million two hundred thousand dollars divided by revenue which was our top line revenue was $12 million. Multiply that by 100. And let's see what we get. Again, we can just do 5.2 divided by 12 times 100. And we get 43.33. So that's 43 and a third percent. This is the net profit margin. The net profit margin is always going to be lower than the gross profit margin. So this is net profit. And in this example, we only took out tax, but there's a thousand other expenses like salaries, marketing expense, things like depreciation, which we'll look at later. There's a thousand other expenses that could be subtracted from the gross profit before um, before you compute the net profit and net profit margin. So there you go. Now for the next problem, we're going to be using only the gross profit numbers. Number four, analyze the results of a change in cost of production. So this is a real world situation here. Assume the price of chicken increases, resulting in a production cost increase of 25%. Recalculate gross profit and gross profit margin, assuming Whataburger wants to maintain a 66 and two-thirds percent profit margin on the honey barbecue chick or the honey butter chicken biscuit, and is willing to raise its menu price. This part right here is extremely important. They are willing to raise the menu price. Remember, we have this situation where. If I raise the menu price, I reduce the quantity that I can sell because people, you're going to move along this, this demand curve here. So if you raise the menu price up, you're going to reduce the number that you can sell because people won't, they won't actually just keep buying 4 million uh, honey butter chicken biscuits if you just jack the price up. So to raise a menu price is a big deal since it could reduce in a loss of it could result in a loss of profit. All right, so we're going to find out what happens here. And this is a pretty uh, this is a pretty common occurrence. You know, the price of chicken goes up, so now everything that you make costs more because the honey butter chicken biscuit, one of the key ingredients, is chicken. So if the price of chicken goes up, the whole unit cost goes up and You'll either have to take less profit or you'll have to a profit margin or you'll have to increase your price. So let's figure out what's going to happen here. First, let's figure out the new unit cost. Well, in a previous part of the problem, we were told that the original unit cost was one dollar. OK, and what we're going to do is multiply it by one plus 
the increase in the price as a decimal, so 1 plus 0.25. And so the new unit cost is $1 times 1.25. This is pretty simple. It's just 1.25. And that is $1.25 per unit. That's the new unit cost. Okay, so this is the new cost. Well, let's see what that does. Um, <clears throat> we have to figure out from this new cost, we have to figure out the new price. So here's how we're going to calculate the new price. This is actually somewhat um, elliptical in how you're going to have to do this because you want to maintain a certain profit margin. Okay, so you can't just directly compute the new cost. You have to figure out what, how much to raise it by so that you maintain this profit margin. So let's go back to the previous problem here. And remember that we calculated gross profit margin. Okay, that's what it gave us, 66 and two-thirds percent gross profit margin. The way we found it is we took revenue or sales minus cost over sales. So let's plug in what we have here. Our new price is going to be the total revenue of each individual item, which we'll just call the price. All right. Minus the cost, which we know, that's 1.25 over the price of the item, and that's going to be equal to 66 and two-thirds percent as a decimal, and that's just 0.66 uh, or 0.6 repeating, and we should write it as a fraction, 0.6 repeating, here I'll, I'll show you this, 0.6 repeating as a fraction is equal to 6 over 9 which is equal to two-thirds, right? So this is all equal to two-thirds. You could write 0.6 repeating, but so you can't put 0.6 repeating in the calculator. So now we have to get uh, price by itself, right? So actually, how do we do that? Well, we have to actually multiply both sides of this equation by price. Okay, so first I'll multiply price on both sides. And the benefit of doing that is on the left side, I get rid of that denominator, and now I have price minus 1.25 equals 2 thirds times price. And now if I subtract price from both sides, I'll have my prices all on the same side of the equation. And notice what I'm doing. This is on the left side. These cancel. I have negative $1.25 cost equals 2 thirds minus 1. Well, 2 thirds minus 3 thirds is negative 1 third. That's negative 1 third times price. Okay, well now, let me just make sure that you can see that that's a negative one-third. Okay, now to get price by itself, I just multiply both sides of my equation by the reciprocal of negative one-third, which would be negative three over one. Okay, so on the left, these all cancel out, and I just have the price equals, and now we take negative 3 times negative 1.25, and we get 3.75, 3.75. That's the dollar amount of the honey butter chicken biscuit, right? So now we have to go back to our graph and figure out, <clears throat> and we'll compute it as well, but we'll, figure, we'll just do it graphically. What it's saying is I'm going to raise my price from price equilibrium up to $3.75. That's right here. Now watch how I do this with my pencil. 
you need a straight edge, okay? Follow that $3.75 line until you hit the demand curve. See, I hit the demand curve right there. Now, follow that down until you hit the quantity supplied. So that way of saying at $3.75, I'm only going to be supplying 1 million units of the honey butter chicken biscuits because the quantity demanded, okay, we're on the demand line here, the quantity demanded at a price of $3.75 is 1 million honey butter chicken biscuits. So it wants us to recalculate all this stuff. But first, we have to verify that. So remember, our quantity demanded equation was 16 minus 4 times P. Okay? So with the price, we, are, we know is $3.75. So we want to know how much do these people demand, okay, in quantity terms, when the price is $3.75. Now, this is actually a function. If you ever want to look at this, this is Q of P. Okay, and that's equal to 16 minus 4 P, right? So you're just plugging in $3.75 here. Q of $3.75 is equal to 16 minus 4 times $3.75. And that's why it's so beneficial to have written the demand equation out like that. So now let's do this. 16 minus 4, 3.75. Make sure to put those parentheses in there. And you get 1. That's what we thought it would be. So the quantity demanded is 1 million units. Well, now let's do our revenue analysis on 1 million units. So remember that revenue or sales is equal to the price per unit, $3.75, times the number of units sold, which is 1 million. Okay, that's 3.75 million or three million seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars right well what are our costs remember our costs have changed our costs are now one dollar and twenty five cents times a million and that's equal to one million two hundred and fifty thousand dollars okay so our gross profit, gross profit is going to be equal to three million seven hundred fifty thousand dollars minus one million two hundred fifty thousand dollars. And that's going to be two million five hundred thousand dollars. Well, let's compute the gross profit margin. Remember, that's just going to be 2,500,000 divided by sales, which was 3,750,000. Do you remember what it should be? It should be 66 and two thirds percent. Remember, we're going to multiply it by 100. So that's 2.5 divided by 3.75 gives us times 100 gives us 66 and two-thirds percent. All right, if you want to take out the tax, then here, we can just do it here. We have 2,500,000 times 0.35. There's your tax. All right, so now you take 2,500,000 minus the tax, and you get 1625000 Divide that by the top line sales, which was 3750000 
multiply it by 100, and you're, again, you saw that from before, that your uh, net profit margin stayed the same. Okay, but we only had to compute the gross profit margin here. Okay, so we computed all of our new things. And now you can see the effect that a change in a change in the cost of production on the supply side can dramatically affect the profit that a company can make because the quantity demanded will change uh, based on the change in the unit cost. Okay. Number five, analyzing the effects of government taxation. The government imposes a 25 cent tax on each honey butter chicken biscuit sold. Calculate the total cost of the tax and determine the tax shouldered by consumers and Whataburger, the producer, the supplier. Graph the impact of the tax on a coordinate plane. Okay. This is better shown visually. So let's go back here and let me take a colored pencil and draw in a dotted line here at price equilibrium. Okay. Now it said we're going to impose a 25 cent tax on our um, on our honey butter chicken biscuits. So if I add 25 cents to three dollars, I'll be here. All right. So now let me choose a color. I'll use this red color here. I'm going to draw in, okay, so this is the price that people will pay, $3.25. That's the price people will pay, but it's not the price that the producer will get. See, taxation is shared by both the consumer and the producer, but they don't shoulder equal burdens. You just draw in this little rectangle here. Now, the total area of this rectangle is the total amount of tax. All right, so let's think about the area of the rectangle. What is the height here of the rectangle or the width? Well, it's the difference between 325 and 2.5. 3.25 minus 2.5. 25. That's 0.75. Okay, so this is 0.75. And then what is this distance here? Well, it's 3, 0 to 3, 3. All right? This is 3. Now, we should verify this, okay? So we should verify what the quantity demanded is at a price of $3.25. So we want to know what is the quantity demanded at $3.25. Remember our quantity, our demand function said Q sub D is equal to 16 minus 4 times price and we were going to input the price of $3.25. Okay, so quantity demanded is equal to 16 minus 4 times 3.25, which is 13. 16 minus 13, that's 3. So the quantity demanded is 3. Look over here. See, 3. That's what we thought. Now, it's working out really great on this graph, but when you have more complicated graphs or you don't have that nice little grid pattern in the background, you really do need to do the math. So this is actually the length of the box. Okay, that's called the tax wedge, by the way. This, um, this big box is called the tax wedge. Okay, so now we have to figure out what quantity supplied is or what the uh, quantity supplied is at, rather, I need, I need to say this. We know that our production quantity is going to be 3 million units, okay? So I want to know what the price that the supplier will receive will be. See, I need to find out what this point is right here. I need to know the 
y coordinate of this point. Now, I think it's 2.5, right? But we want to verify that. So remember, our, our supply function was q sub s equals negative 2 plus 2 times p. But remember, I also had that inverse uh, function, which said the price okay, is equal to 1 half q sub s plus 1. I can use either of these equations. I'll use this one since I want to know the price for the supplier. Well, that's 1 half times 3 plus 1. Okay, so the price to the supplier is equal to 1 times 3 over 2, 3 over 2, plus 2 over 2. Well, let's see, that's 5 over 2. And 5 over 2 is 2.5, or $2.50. And that is, in fact, what we see here on this graph, $2.50. Just want to let you know that when it's not so nice and clean, then uh, you don't really know. And so what you have to do now is take the price to the consumer okay, and subtract the price to the supplier. And that's equal to 325 minus 250, right? And that's how we got that 0 0.75, 0 0.75. Okay, and this is the width of the tax wedge. Okay, well, we now find the area of the tax wedge, total tax, total tax revenue to the government. That's going to be equal to length times width, okay, the area of the tax wedge. Okay, so that's 3 times 0.75. What is that equal to? 3 times 0.75. 2.25 million dollars, because this is 3 million units times 75 cents, which is two million two hundred and fifty thousand zero 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 dollars. Okay, wow, that's a huge amount that they're taking away from this economy to fund some government program. Okay, that's the total tax revenue to the government. Remember, that's not going to the consumers or the producers. It's going to the government. All right. Now we have to calculate the we calculated the total tax that was two million two hundred fifty. Determine the tax shouldered by consumers and Waterburger. Okay. So here's the tax shouldered. The tax shouldered by consumers. I'll show you how to calculate that. You know it's it's pretty um, kind of visually obvious what you do you have to compute the area of this little box right here. Well, we know the length is 3, and the height here would be 3.25 minus 3, which is just 0.25. So the tax to the consumers is 3 million units times 25 cents. Remember, they put a 25 cent tax, so that's 0.25. 3 times 0.25 equals... $750,000. Okay, that's a lot of money to be paying on the consumer side. How about the tax to the supplier, to Whataburger? Okay, well, again, I can look at this picture here. What's the distance between 3 and, and 2.5? Well, that's 0.5, and this is 3, so it's 3 times 0.5. Well, that's 3, that's 3 divided by 2, which is just 1.5, so this is 1,500,000. Wow, okay? And, and here we, can, we could have seen 
that the tax to the supplier was going to be greater because look at the size of the box is bigger. Okay, now what's this next part? Compute the dead weight loss. All right, here's what the dead weight lot is, loss is. It's this little area in here. So this is the tax right in here. That's what we computed was a total of $2,250,000. The dead weight loss is this area, this little triangle area right here. See, I'll try to shade it in for you here, okay? So we have to find the area of that triangle. Remember, the area of a triangle is base times height divided by 2. Dead weight loss. This is just capacity taken directly out of the economy because of the taxation. So dead weight loss is equal to the area of this triangle. Well, what's the height of the triangle? You turn it like this, you can see it better. It's 1. 3 to 4. Okay, see that? It's 1. The base of the triangle is 0.75. So, dead weight loss is equal to three, uh, 1 times 0.75, oops, can't see what I'm writing, divided by 2. Okay, and this is going to be money. So we just take 0.75 divided by 2 is 0.375. That's $375,000. That's just been taken directly out of this little market economy. Okay? So that's bad. This is all stuff we needed to compute. All right, calculate the post-tax consumer and producer surpluses. All right, let's talk about producer and consumer surplus. You see these triangles right here? I'll do the consumer surplus in blue. This triangle right here is the consumer surplus up here. This is the consumer surplus. And I'll label all this here in a second if I remember. Okay, The blue is the consumer surplus. So we'll have to find the area of that triangle. The producer surplus is going to be here down here in orange. And the key thing to notice here is that we're leaving out of these surpluses this tax here. So if I hadn't removed the tax wedge, that's why it's called the wedge, I would have more consumer surplus and more producer surplus. All right. So I'm just going to find first the area of that blue triangle. All right. So this is going to be the consumer surplus post-tax. Post-tax consumer surplus. Okay, what is that equal to? Well, the base of that thing is the distance between 4 and 3.25. Look over here. Here it's 4 and 3.25 is the bottom. So you could do 4 minus 3.25, 0.75, and the height of that triangle is 3. Okay, see that? The height of that triangle is 3. So that's 0.75 times 3 is 2.25. So the post-tax consumer surplus is 2 million. $250,000. By the way, what was the pre-tax consumer surplus? Here's the pre-tax. So you can see how much was lost. Well, the pre-tax consumer surplus would be 4 times 1 over 2. Okay? Because it's this whole triangle here. So 4 times 1 is 4 divided by 2 is 2. Oops, I think I forgot to uh, divide by 2. <laughs> okay, oops. So let me go back here. I need to divide this by 2. 
and then I'll be done. Okay, so now we'll take that 2,250,000 divide by two, and we get a total post-tax consumer surplus of $1,125,000. Okay, so this is the post-tax consumer surplus. The pre-tax consumer surplus was $2 million. Okay. Um, now, let's calculate the uh, post-tax producer surplus, because that's the other thing it asks us for. Post-tax producer surplus. Well, let's figure it out. It's the area of this orange triangle here. So that's 1 to 2.5. That's 1.5 as a base and 3 as a height. So that's 1.5 times 3 over 2. All right. 1.5 times 3 over 2 is $2,250,000. All okay. This is the post-tax producer surplus. The pre-tax was... Two times four is eight divided by two is four million. Okay, the pre tax was four million. So you see how much has been taken out of this economy here. We had a pre tax consumer surplus at two million dropped to one million hundred and twenty five thousand, and a pre tax producer surplus of four million dropped to two million two hundred and fifty thousand. All right, that sucks, you know. And the difference between those two is equal to the tax wedge plus the deadweight loss. All right, our tax revenue was 2,250,000, our deadweight loss was 375. 2.25 plus 0.375 equals 2.625. That's the total amount um, of the tax and the deadweight loss. Okay. So if we take uh, six four million plus six million or plus uh, four million plus two million, we get six million minus the sum of one point one two five plus two point two five, and we get two point six two five. That's where that is coming from. Okay, so you can look at it better on the picture that when you remove this tax wedge, the whole thing, and you leave this deadweight loss behind, you only have these little surpluses left. So let's label this stuff. So this is going to be the post tax consumer surplus. Okay, uh, this is the this right here is the post tax producer surplus. And this area right here, Okay, this is the dead weight loss. And this area in here is the tax wedge. And that's all the different stuff we just computed. 
Okay, there's all of our calculations for all this stuff right here. It's pretty cool, right? Um, okay, so now we're done with that problem. Oh, we're supposed to recalculate Whataburger's net profit and net profit margin, assume a 35% corporate tax rate. What it wants us to do is recalculate at a total sale of 3 million units. Here's what it means. We only get $2.5 per unit after this tax is imposed. So to recalculate that profit, okay, this is part D down here. Recalculate the profit, we multiply 2.5, okay, that's $2.50 times 3 million, and we get $7,500,000. Okay. Uh, we subtract out our cost. Remember, our cost was 1.25 times the $1.25 times 3 million. 3,750,000. All right. And so our, this is our sales. And so that means that our uh, gross profit is equal to Sales minus cost of sales, so that's 7.5 minus 3.75. That's $3,750,000. Okay, that's a lot lower. What was our other one? So, oh, this was the, the very first one we did. Our gross profit was $8 million. Right, look at, now our gross profit's $3.75 million. That is a massive de decrease due to the taxation and the change in the cost of the product. Okay, and it wants us to take that and then figure tax. So what is tax? Tax is 35% of that number. Okay, so that's uh, 1,312,500. So we'll call our net profit, gross profit minus tax, net profit is going to be equal to 3.75 minus 1.3125 gives me 2,437,500. Okay, so that's my net profit. What's my net profit margin? Well, my net profit margin is just my net profit divided by sales times 100. It's only 32.5% now. Let's go back and look at what our net profit margin was before. I guess we could compute our gross profit margin as well. 3.75 divided by 7.5 is 50%. So our gross profit margin was 50%. Okay, remember before, we had a gross profit margin of 66 and two-thirds percent and a net profit margin of 43 and a third percent. Well, now our net profit margins dropped to 32.5% and our gross profit margins dropped to 50%. Ooh, not good. Okay. So that was a heavy page. And now we'll move on to a crazy heavy page. Making decisions about capital investments. All right. Now here, guys, I really want you to just follow along with me. So you can kind of get a glimpse of how business people make decisions involving millions and millions of dollars, kind of in the real world. 
Uh, let's read this together. A project manager proposes installing new equipment that can increase production capacity by 2 million honey butter chicken biscuits per year for five years at a cost of $6 million, financed for five years at 12%. Assume the equipment will be depreciated on a straight line basis for five years. Assume a corporate income tax rate of 35%. Assume a weighted average cost of capital, that's WAC, weighted average cost of capital, of 12%. Assume the unit cost of a honey barbecue chicken biscuit stays constant at $1. So compute the net present value of the project. All right, so here's how you compute the net present value. First, we've got to understand something. We're going to be using our calculator quite a bit here. But let me show you how the net present value is calculated. So you take the cost of the project, all right, which is negative $6 million, right? You have to put it as a negative number because you're going to lose $6 million. That's your outlay. Now, what are your ongoing profits? Well, here's how, you, here's how you figure that out. First, we have to go back here and figure out what will happen if we are able to increase our production by 2 million units. Let's go back to our market equilibrium here. All right. If I can take this from 4 and go up to 6, this will be my new quantity supplied. All right. So here's what I want to do. I want to draw a dotted line up from here just like that okay now what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift this entire supply curve over until it's right here I'm going to shift the whole thing over like this okay that's what I'm going to do but I'm just going to draw it in like that right I actually have to compute a new supply function all right, so I need to look at the coordinates right here. So I need to find out what the price will be, okay, at a quantity supplied of 6 million. So before I really do any of this work, I need to figure out what my new price will be. So remember, quantity supplied equals negative 2 plus 2 times price. And we had that inverse function that said price equals one half times quantity supplied plus one. Okay, so I want to know what price is. I'll use the inverse function. One half times, in this case, I'm going to be at six million units plus one. Okay, so the price is equal to six times, six divided by two is three plus one is four. Okay, four dollars. Wait a minute. <clears throat> oh, I'm using my old supply function. I can't use that function. That's not right. That is not right at all. So here's how you're going to compute your new supply function. You're going to have to compute a brand new supply function, and your slope is going to be the same as it was in the original equation. The slope was one half. Okay, and it's going to be passing through. We'll use the demand function to figure out what the price is. That's what we're going to do. Okay. We're going to have to figure out what, what it's passing through. And so we'll use our demand function, price demand. I used the wrong equation. Negative one-fourth times six million plus four. That's going to give us the correct price. So the price demanded is going to be uh, negative six over four plus... What is that? 16 over 4. Okay, so that's 10 over 4. What is that? Should be 2.5. 10 divided by 4. 2.5. Good. Again, I was just trying to check. I was trying to check the visual. Look, when I go up here and hit this curve, and then I hang a left... I see I'm right at 2.5. You see that? 
And so I was just checking to make sure this was going to be right. So I don't want to do that. I want to create a brand new equation. So now I'm at my x value is 6 and my y value is 2.5. Okay. With a slope of 1 half. So I need to use the or am I going to do this? I need to use the uh, point slope formula. Let me go down here. Y minus Y1 equals M, open parentheses, X minus X1, close parentheses. So Y minus 2.5 equals 1 half. It's going to be the same slope. As parallel lines have the same slope, open parentheses, X minus 2.5, X minus 6. All right, so now I have y minus 2.5 equals 1 half x uh, minus 3. Add 2.5 to both sides. And I have y equals 1 half x. And then negative 3 plus 2.5 gives me negative 0.5. Replace y with p and one half and x with q sub s minus 0.5. Let's solve for q sub s so I can get my new supply equation. So what I'll do is I'll subtract one half q sub s from both sides. Now I've got minus one half q sub s equals, and I'll subtract p from both sides over here, negative p minus 0.5, turn these positive, and then multiply by the reciprocal, 2. Okay? And now I have Q sub S equals uh, 2 times 0.5, uh, 2 over 1 times 1 over 2, that's 1. Okay, so that's 1 plus P. Now, why did I write like that? Because... Now I know my x-intercept is at 1, and so I can connect these points right here and make it perfectly parallel. All right, right there. See, I was going to be slightly off. You want to be right on when you do this. Okay, so this is my new supply curve, S1. So this is my new equilibrium price and quantity right here. Here it is. All right, so the equilibrium supply, this is the equilibrium of the market. The equilibrium supply is 6 million, okay, right there. And the equilibrium price is $2.5 or $2.50. Okay, so now I know what my price is going to be. I can compute my revenue. So here's the deal. We are going to be producing 2 million more units. All right, so let's figure this out. What is our revenue on 2 million units? So if I sell 2 million units, and I'm selling them at my new price equilibrium of $2.50, what am I going to have? Well, 2 times 2.5, that's $5 million, okay? That's my revenue. But what's my cost? All right, here's my cost. It says assume $1. So my cost is equal to $1 times $2 million, and that's $2 million. Okay, so what is my gross profit? My gross profit is $3 million. Okay, this is my gross profit. Now, we have other expenses, okay? One of our expenses is a depreciation expense. Now, straight line means to just divide it by five because it tells us straight line for five years. So you take the cost of the equipment divided by five, and you get six divided by five equals 1.2. What that means is that we're going to be subtracting out 
our depreciation expense. This is a non-cash expense. Now what is that? A 1.2 million? Okay. And then we have to subtract out the amount of money that we're going to be paying um, back on the loan. Okay? Well, we don't want to do that. Um, not yet. All right, let me show you how to figure out how much you're going to pay on this loan. So we actually can do this in the TI. Hit Apps, and then hit Enter on Finance, and then the TVM stands for Time Value of Money. Click that. All right, now we have to figure out the number of periods. All right, so you have to pay your, your, your loan on a monthly basis for five years, so 12 times 5. Okay, so there's 60 periods in this loan. Our interest rate is 12%. Okay, the beginning value is negative 6 million. And we want to know what the payment is. All right, so you hit alpha, enter. And it tells you that the payment is $720,803 a year. Okay, $720 million. Let's do this. Our payment down here, I'll write our payment. And this is payment per period. $720,803. And four cents. All right, so that's per month. You understand? So you have to multiply that by 12. Okay. And so the amount you're going to pay every year is 720803 times 12. You're going to pay $8,649,636. Let me make sure I did that right. Oh, I know what I did wrong. Um, hang on a second. Let's go back here. I forgot something. So my interest is 12 divided by 12. It's going to make a huge difference in the payment. Let me erase this stuff. Made a mistake. Because these numbers didn't make any sense. Okay, because you're, you're taking the interest, which is 12% per year, and you have to divide it by the number of periods in that year and you're paying monthly so it's 12 divided by 12. All right, let's go back down here, put a zero here, and then go up and hit alpha enter. That's better. Okay. So every month we have to pay $133,466.69. So it's 133 466.69. Okay. And that's per month, so per year, what is that? Now we multiply this times 12. We do 133,466.69 times 12. 1 million, 601,000, so 1 million... Six hundred one thousand six hundred and twenty eight cents we're going to be paying on that loan now what I would like to figure out and I guess this calculator is not going to tell me is in here what I'd like to see is what each interest payment is but I'm going to have to use some other calculator here hang on a second Give me just a second.
Let's originate the loan on January 1st. I don't know why I can't. In just a second here, I'm trying to compute the interest payment. Here we go. So for year one, I would pay $669,000 in interest. 669,858,76. Okay, so in year one, I need to do this little interest table here. Year one, two, three, four, five. So this is my interest that I'm paying. I'll show you what I'm looking at here. I've got this year one interest here of 669,858,76, okay? And that's what I'm looking at. My calculator won't do it. 669-858-76-6, That's in year one. I guess I'll have to do it differently. Okay, this will be year one, and then year two, I pay 551,690.59. In year three, I pay 418,535.80 in interest. In year four, I pay 268,493.59. Okay, and then in year five, I pay 99,422.32. All right. <clears throat> so this is year one, year two, year three, year four, and year five. Okay? So. Let me compute this really quick because this is not going to change. 3 million minus 1.2 million. 3 million minus 1.2 million is 1.8 million. So this is gross profit minus depreciation is $1,800,000. Okay, so in order to compute my actual net cash flow, uh, per year, I now have to subtract out the interest payment for each year from that number. So for year one, I take 1,800,000 and I subtract out 669858.76 because interest is tax deductible. All right, so my taxable income for year one is one million one hundred thirty wait one million one hundred thirty thousand one hundred and forty one and twenty four cents. So for year two, I do the same thing. One point eight million minus and then I do five fifty one six ninety point five nine and I get one hundred or one million 248.309.41. Okay, for year three, take 1.8 million minus 418.535.80. And I get 1751464.20. Okay, for year four, 1,800,000 minus 268,493.59 
and I'm getting 1 million 500 31,000 493.59 I think I messed up this previous year here I missed a one there 1,800,000 minus 418535.80 that's better one million three eighty one four sixty four point two zero and then finally in year five I take one million eight hundred thousand and subtract out ninety nine thousand four twenty two point three two and I've got one million seven hundred five seventy seven point six eight Okay, now each of these numbers need to be multiplied by 1 minus the tax rate. Okay, so I can find out what my net profit is per year. So 1 minus 0.35 is 0.65. So I just multiply each one of these by 0.65 and I'll determine my cash flow per year because I'm going to have to pay that tax. Well, it's not really cash flow. Okay, if I'm going to be talking about cash flow, I don't have to do the depreciation. So once I once I calculate this number, I'm going to have to add back depreciation. I remember that. Okay, so now I'm going to take each of these numbers, starting with that one million one hundred thirty thousand. I'm going to multiply it by 0.65. Okay, and then I'm going to add back the depreciation, which is 1.2 million. So add back 1,200,000. And I get 1,934,000 plus 1.2 million. You got to add back depreciation. You need to subtract depreciation in order to calculate the tax. Uh, effect, but then when you're done, you have to add it back in order to understand what the cash flow is, because we only want cash transactions. Depreciation is not a cash transaction. All right, so this is equal to one million nine hundred and thirty-four thousand five hundred ninety-one and eighty-one cents. All right, so that's my year one cash flow. This is what this has all been about. Okay. Year one cash flow. Now here, do the same thing. All the way down, I'm going to be adding back that 1.2 million. So here, I'll go find that 1,248,000 number. Here it is. Take that times 0.65, enter, plus 1,200,000. Okay, 2 million. Okay, this second year is two million eleven thousand four oh one point one two okay year three that's that one three eight one number go find it there it is enter times point six five enter plus add back the depreciation and you get two million ninety seven thousand nine hundred and fifty one point seven three. Okay, that's year three, year four. Go find that one million five hundred thirty one number. Here it is. Enter times point six five. Enter plus one million two hundred thousand. So I can add back that depreciation there after I find my profit. So now I add back 2,195,479.17. Okay, next up, uh, year five. 
So that's that 1,700,000 number. Here it is. Times 0.65 plus 1,200,000. Okay, so in year five, I make the most money back on my project, which is 2,305,000. $375.49. Okay, so I need these cash flow numbers up here. <clears throat> I'm going to have to write this in a different way because I run out of room writing all over this page. I'm going to have to write sideways. So to compute net present value, here's what you do. So you have your years. You have year zero year one, year two, year three, year four, and year five. See that? So in year zero, I spend six million dollars. Well, if you think about it, I don't actually spend six million because I'm financing the whole thing. I think this will still work. Okay, so in year one, what will be my uh, cash flow for that year? That was one million nine hundred thirty-four thousand. Uh, let's see. One million nine hundred thirty four thousand five hundred ninety one. We'll just round to the nearest whole number here five hundred ninety two. Okay, in year two, I was going to earn two million eleven thousand four hundred one dollars. In year three, I was going to earn two million ninety seven thousand four seventy nine. In year four, I was going to earn two million. This is cash flow one ninety five four seventy nine. Wait, can't both be 479. This is uh, should be 952 right here. This is so much easier on a spreadsheet. And then here I've got 2 million in fifth year, 2 million, 305,000, 375 dollars. Okay, so. These are the cash flows that will be coming in each year as a result of my investment. All right? Um, in the new equipment. And so what we need to do is divide each of these numbers. I'll show you what we're going to do. This is how you do this, okay? Our weighted average cost of capital, whack is 12%. We put that as 0.12, okay? And so here it's 1 plus 0.12 or 1.12 and that's raised to the first power, okay? And then you have 1.12 raised to the second power, 1.12 raised to the third power, 1.12 raised to the fourth power, 1.12 raised to the fifth power. All right, so let's compute all these numbers. So, one piece at a time, we'll go grab that 1,934,000 number divided by, here we'll get the whole thing, divided by 1.12 raised to the first power. 
okay? That is 1 million. This is our discounted cash flows. What I'm asking the question is, what are these cash flows worth in today's dollars if my investment rate is 12%, okay? So I say $1,727,314, right? That's the year one discounted cash flow in today's money. All right, and now what's this one? 2,011,000, go find that guy there. There he is. Divided by 1.12 raised to the second power. 1,603,476. 1,603,470. Well, if I round up, 477. And now I'll go find that 2,000,000. 97,000, 2,097,951 divided by 1.12 raised to the third power. Okay, and we get 1,493,280. I should say 281. We're going to add them all anyway from the calculator. And now I go find that 2195. There it is. Okay, divide that by 1.12 raised to the fourth. All right, and this is 1,395,266. I should say 267 rounded up. And then finally, year five, that's that 2305 number. There it is. Divided by 1.12 raised to the fifth. Okay, and that's going to be 1,308,131, 131, uh, well, I should round up to 2, 132. All right, so now what I want is I want to know what the sum of the discounted cash flows are. Okay, so I want the sum of all these numbers. So here's how we're going to do it. This one plus the one before it, plus the one before that, plus the one before that, plus the initial one, 727 on there. Add all that up, 752, here. This equals 7,527,000. 0 0.04, okay? Now, what you do is you now add, okay, your negative 6 million. That was your initial cost. And this is the net present value. If this number is positive, then we should do the project. Okay, 15, 1,527,000 here, 1,527,470.04. So this is a positive number. All right, because this is a positive number, we should do the project, all right? Because what it means is in today's dollars, this project will add $1,527,470.04 to our company's uh, net worth. Okay, so that's how you compute net present value. Now, the calculator will do it for you, um, but you'd have to enter in all these numbers into a formula, which we're going to have to do here in a second because now we have to compute the internal rate of return, IRR. Okay internal rate of return. So what we're going to do is hit apps, finance, and go down to IRR. Okay, and the first thing I have to put in is the cost of the project, which is $6 million. Okay, and then I hit comma, second, 
open the parentheses, and now I'm going to have to type all this in. So my year one cash flow is 1934592, comma. My year two cash flow is 2011401, comma. My year three cash flow is 2199. Comma. My year four cash flow is two three zero five. Wait, did I put them in right? Two zero one one. Oh, I skipped one. This should be two zero nine seven nine five two, and then this one should be two one nine five. Four seven nine, comma year five two three zero、oh、five three seven five. Okay, close that bracket. Second parentheses closes the bracket, comma, and then second parentheses opens the bracket. One comma one, comma one comma one, comma one. Second parentheses close that bracket. And this should compute. Yeah, 21.52 percent. Okay, so IRR equals 21.52 percent. Now, this is greater than 12 percent, which is our weighted average cost of capital. Therefore, we should do the project. So, by two different valuation methods, we discover that. We should invest in、uh, in this equipment、uh, so we can make more. Now, this whole part about、um, recalculate, assuming they issue stock instead of financing it, we're just going to skip this because it would require a whole bunch of additional calculations.、Um, because we will in in problem C, we found that they yes, they should buy the equipment. Okay. Now I know this was really、uh, really complicated, and、uh, the way I did it was very chaotic.、Uh, but you know, this gives you an idea. I really just wanted to give an idea of what it is like to do actual、um, economic and financial analysis. You know, using a real-world problem. Okay, so I didn't want to. Uh, baby, this problem, you know, to the to the extent possible, I wanted this to be a、um, a really rigorous example of economic and financial analysis. So let's see what we did. First, we found our supply and demand functions. Then we graph them. We calculated profit and margin. We analyze the results of a change in the cost of production. Okay, that's where, we're, and then we analyze the effects of government taxation, and that's where we had to come back to our our graph here and compute the tax wedge and the surpluses and the deadweight losses and all that good stuff. And then this page here, what we did in order, just so you understand, we calculated a new supply curve、um, because we increased our supply. We wanted to analyze the proposal to increase our supply by two million units. The problem is it was going to cost six、uh, million dollars, and we are going to finance it using a loan, okay,、uh, for five years at twelve percent. So all of this calculation down here was me trying to figure out what our cash flows were, and I'll just explain what I did, okay? Because I know I started to get a little off where I wasn't doing a very good job of explaining it at the end there. I took our profit, or I took our、um, our quantity.
the difference in our quantity equilibrium and our quantity supplied, 6 minus 4 was 2 million. So this whole, um, this whole project would increase our supply by 2 million. So I took the increase in supply and I multiplied it by the new uh, equilibrium market price of $2.50 to get our projected sales numbers from the new equipment only. I just wanted to I analyze that new equipment. I didn't want to compute the total sales for the whole thing. So then I computed our cost at just that 2 million new units, and we said it was a dollar per unit. Got my 3 million, which was my gross profit. Subtracted depreciation. Got 1.8 million. And then I had to switch over to my computer in order to find out my interest payments every year. Because the way that a loan works is early in the loan, you're going to be paying a huge amount of interest. Okay? But as the loan goes on, your interest payments, your the percentage of your total monthly payment that is dedicated to interest falls significantly. So that's where you saw me flip over to the internet browser to get these numbers. It's called a loan amortization schedule. All right. There is a way to calculate it by hand, but I can't remember how to do it off the top of my head. So the online calculator is a lifesaver. Um, so that's what that's what this is. So then I um, I took my uh, Gross profit minus depreciation, which was eight one million eight hundred thousand, and I subtracted this number from it. Okay, so one million eight hundred thousand minus six sixty nine. I got this number, which was my um, earnings, or, or my earnings after I subtract interest and depreciation. All right. So then to compute tax, because you're able to deduct both your interest on your loan and your depreciation, you can deduct those. I uh, multiplied that times 0.65 because my corporate income tax rate was 35%. So my profit margin on that 35% tax rate would be 65%. I multiplied it by 65% and then I added back the depreciation because depreciation, while it is an income charge, it's an income expense. It is not a cash expense. Depreciation is a non-cash value. So I had to add it back in order to get my actual net cash flow per year. And it changed every year. It got bigger and bigger as the time went on. And then I took those numbers over here and I discounted them using a discount rate of 12%, which we are calling our weighted average cost of capital. You know, you could do this differently. You could... Um, you could discount it 12% in the first year and then discount it at like the risk-free rate in, in, in the ongoing years. There's a lot of things that you could do. Uh, but, but we wanted to discount at our, our, uh, our investment rate, our, our, our cost of capital rate for each year. Okay, And then I got these discounted cash flow numbers and I added them together and I got this number, which was the sum of the discounted cash flows. And then I subtracted the original cost of the project and I came out with a positive net present value number. Okay. And so then I calculated the internal rate of return using the calculator. And remember with net present value, what you're looking for is to see a non, a, a number that is greater than zero. Okay. So 1.5 million is greater than zero. The internal rate of return is uh, 21.52%. And as long as that's bigger than your, your, your discount rate or your weighted average cost of capital, uh, you're fine. Okay, here's the key. If this internal rate of return had been less than 12%, you wouldn't want to do the project because if your IRR is less than your WAC, okay, then you'll eventually go bankrupt. So if your IRR is less than your weighted average cost of capital, then you will go bankrupt over time. So we want to make sure that our internal rate of return on our projects is greater than our weighted average cost of capital, and that's how we can make sure that we continue to profit as a business. So by all this economic analysis and financial analysis, we came up with the decision, yes. right? And people will pay you hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars a year, if you can understand how to do all this stuff, okay? And there's, you know, there's more to it, 
but I showed a good chunk of it here. This is basic capital investment analysis. So if you have any clue what I did or you want to learn more, get with me and I can slow this thing down and show you step by step how I got all this stuff. All right. So if you went to work for a company and you were like an actuary or you were a, an investment analyst or a business analyst, okay, maybe you got a master's in business or something or a master's of science in accounting, um, or if you got a, a master's in economics, then you would be expected to perform this kind of analysis in real businesses, possibly even for Whataburger. So I hope you found this video interesting and helpful. I hope also you saw some cool things that the uh, TI-84 can do. If you did, please give this video a like. This was a lot of work here. Hour and 56 minutes it took to do five pages of math. Um, I really am glad that I got a chance to introduce you to this supply and demand graphs here. This is super cool stuff, and it's stuff that you'll study in college. So um, you should study in high school. We don't really teach it anymore, but... Anyway, leave the video a like, uh, leave the video a thumbs up, leave a comment if you would, that really boosts the algorithm. And if you have not already, please subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell so you're always alerted when I release new videos. Thank you very much.